Wisconsin. I would also like to take this time to introduce our other work group members who have helped with this program today. Lissa Seafelt in Eau Claire County, Jackie McCarville in Green County, Heather Schlesler in Marathon County, and Erica Bierstrom in Kiwani County. Also along with um, Dr. Victor Cabrera, who is one of our speakers today, and Dr. Liliana Falu, and Dan Diedrich, who will be joining us later in the program. BDI is a program, the Badger Dairy Insight Series, that is running bi-weekly at this time. It is on Tuesdays from 1 until 2.30 p.m. We'd like to thank you for joining us. And um, you can register anytime by going to go.wisp.edu um, slash farm ready research. There are other programs happening in different areas besides uh, dairy as well. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Victor Cabrera is a professor and extension specialist in dairy management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Dairy Science Department. Dr. Cabrera combines applied research interdisciplinary approaches and participatory methods to deliver practical, user-friendly, and scholarly decision support tools for dairy farm management. These scientific tools are aimed to improve dairy farm profitability, environmental stewardship, and long-term sustainability of the dairy industry. Um, so with that, we would like to welcome Dr. Cabrera. Thanks, Ashley, and um, thanks everyone in the extension group to making this possible. I mean, we are extremely excited to share the stage here with Liliana, you're gonna hear from her later on, and Dan, who is a farmer who has been working with us in this data money, participating of the data money program, extension program within the Dairy Brain project we have uh, in my lab at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So we are very excited, I was saying, because uh, we think there is a huge opportunity here for improving decision-making on dairy farms. I think farmers have lots of uh, data, uh, which brings challenges, but big opportunities for improving management and decision-making. So briefly, uh, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna start and give you a uh, brief and high level overview of what the dairy brain is, what we are trying to do, what we are doing, and where we want to end up and accomplish. And then Liliana is going to talk more specifically about the data money extension program. And the real treat today is Dan Diederik, who is going to talk at the end, giving a testimony of being part of this data money program. So. Without further ado, let's get to it. So uh, we put together this slide to, to give you an idea of um, the main motivation be, uh, behind the Dairy Brain project. And this is what we call, or we define the dairy data, data ecosystem in dairy farms is nowadays. And probably many of you will feel familiar uh, with this situation. The situation I'm trying to describe is the fact that dairy farms have nowadays and every time more different data streams uh, generating, producing data on the farm from the cows uh, and from other different devices uh, connected to the whole herd and the farm uh, together that produce valuable data, like for example, data that comes from the milking parlor or data that comes from all the feeding system or the DHI uh, uh, monthly tests that are very popular and common in dairy farms or genetic and genomics that are every time more uh, used on dairy farms, for example. Each one of these and more and growing are very important data source for decision-making and management. And that's why they are growing. That's why they are, there is a huge effort on collecting and cleaning and using this data. By themselves, they are valuable. 
uh, using specifically the genomic or genetic data or using specifically DHI information or data for making decisions, it's valuable and has been proven uh, in research and extension setups. And nowadays we are inundated with sensors, for example, as well. Uh, let's talk about, for example, sensors for heat detections. They are very valuable. Nowadays, they have been proven to be uh, part of many dairy farm systems. They are valuable. But what we are proposing is the fact that these systems are not connected to each other. They live in their own silo. They are independently managed. They provide value that way. But the value would be much greater if we would connect the data from the sensors together with the milking data, as well as the feed and the DHI and the genomics on top and everything, if we can put all this data, but the challenge is to put all this data in real time and provide those data to specific decision-making tools that could help farmers make decisions. In summary, I mean, farmers have lots of data. These data are isolated and they will have much more value if this data will be connected. But the challenge is to connect this data in real time, continuously, and connect those to decision-making tools. So farmers have those tools to make better decisions. So based on that motivation, what we are trying to do within the Dairy Brain project is basically a continuous loop. As you can see, we try to visualize that in this uh, circle here that will be continuous, that it starts in collecting the data from the farm, putting this data of different sources in one central location. And from that central location, we will have these uh, computer algorithms that will transform, harmonize, clean, decode all this data. So the data from different sources becomes one big data set on which we can apply these analytical services. And when I talk about analytical services are these tools, for example, a tool that will help farmers to make better decisions in reproduction, culling, and, and at the same time, using different genomic uh, protocols for the newborns, for example. Or another tool could be, for example, to decide when to call a cow on the herd, but that decision will need to use data from production, from uh, reproduction, maybe data from genomics, et cetera, et cetera, but all should be together in one place for the tool to be uh, the most efficient possible. So that's what we call value added information based on the integrated data. And we, we plan to provide this in a web interface, which is the modern way in which uh, farmers and other uh, decision makers could use the data effectively. But one thing we are very careful as well, and, and we are very keen to, is that this should be a continuous process, meaning that every time farmers are using the system, they should be able to provide feedback for us to improve the whole system and make it better as it goes in the future. So that's the main background and the main idea of the dairy brain. In, in a short, integrate all the different data streams on the farm to provide additional value on those data for making better decision-making at the farm and make it this continuous so the whole system improves as it goes. So based on that, our strategy is based on these four pillars. On the bottom here is create a coordinated innovation network. And here we put to shape the data service development. And we're gonna hear about more about this uh, that's already in place for a couple of years already as part of our project. In number two here, another goal or objective of the project is to create what we call the agricultural data hub. So basically is a prototype uh, database, a very dynamic database 
that will be able to gather and disseminate multiple data streams for the next step, which is basically the analytical modules. And this is the part we call specifically the dairy brain part within the dairy brain project. So the idea is to leverage all this aggregation of data, integration of data to provide uh, better insights to the management and decision making on dairy farms. And in four here, very important on top of this pyramid is the extension program. And we're gonna talk today, we're gonna uh, center our uh, talk today about the data money program that is at the center of the extension program. And so I'm gonna leave that uh, for later on. Lilian is gonna be talking in much more detail about it. So now let's talk a bit about the coordinated innovation network. So it's a large community, community of, of people that is helping us to bring in together uh, different disciplines and domains to identify innovative and synergistic solutions for the main issue or main challenge of the situation of the data ecosystem on dairy farms. So the roles of this coordinated innovation network is basically raise awareness of the value of data integration on farms, facilitate this process by exchange of opinions and discussions, and create guidelines. So we are trying to develop and create these opinion articles. Some of them are out there as well. I have some examples next. And develop more involved design documents that are also out, some of them. So some of you may have seen uh, in 2020, uh, it's incredible, it's gonna be two years already, uh, these opinion articles that came as a series in the Hortz Dairyman. Starting in February, 2020, uh, we started with the first article, like introduction article of help us to help you make better decisions with your daily data the first article. And then we follow with uh, similar articles like uh, all related to data and the data ecosystem and decision-making on dairy farms. Uh, the series uh, had at the end five articles and we ended up in May, 2020. And that was great because it gave us a first step on the at large industry discussion. So we were able to actually engage more people in the discussion on how we can better use data and how better can manage data on, on dairy farms. And actually we get a larger community involved and our coordinated innovation network membership grew quite a bit from that point on. And with a uh, group of uh, members of the coordinated innovation network, we actually last year published a couple of uh, what we think very important papers in, in this area of data in the dairy farm industry. The first one you can see here, and by the way, these are peer review articles, so that are more involved. And the other thing that's interesting to highlight here, uh, these bold articles that have been published last year have a large number of co-authors, many of them, well, all of them are part of the Coordinated Innovation Network or part of the Dairy Brain team, which is a great collaboration uh, uh, demonstration between the Dairy Brain and the Coordinated Innovation Network on ideas, for example, on top here, ideas of how to better adopt and maintain adoption of integrated decision support systems or tools and below here, you have another very important article in our opinion about data governance in the dairy industry. You can Im imagine these articles are different than the ones we are used to produce that are more research-based. These are more opinion. As you can see here, these are commentary articles, but I think they are as important as the others in order to shape and continue this discussion 
on how we can improve the use of data on dairy farms in the dairy industry. And at the moment, actually, we are working on another article about best practices of data communication and data collection that soon should be uh, published as well in this series of articles. So next thing I wanna to touch base with you is about the, the agricultural data hub. We started uh, the discussion with all these data sources on the farm that are constantly providing data and a dairy data ecosystem that don't connect these data sources. So what we wanna do is put a, a system like a funnel here to connect all these data streams within this agricultural data hub and provide permission access to decision support tools within the dairy brain um, system. So as you can see here, uh, conceptually, it is uh, relatively simple what we are trying to do, but you, uh, I would like you to, to think on the complexity involved behind making this happen in an automatic way. Because each one of these vendors or processing companies of data will have their own peculiarities. The data comes in different formats. And we need a system that would be able to recognize each one of these systems, extract the data efficiently, and connect the data from different systems basically on real time and provide this data to the tools that can use effectively this data. So what we are doing within the agricultural data hub is a series of steps that hopefully you, you are able to recognize here that are heavily needed in order to make this data usable within the framework we are describing. So you can see here, in general, we propose these five steps that uh, indeed are already working uh, partially in our system. Uh, the first step is accessing the data. That by itself is a challenge. We need different vendors like Feed. There is a company that provides the FeedWatch software, for example, that's very different than TMR Tracker. And we need to be able to recognize the format and extract the data from each one of these different systems or companies or vendors or uh, data generators on the farm. There will be different milking parlors data. There will be data uh, to collect management and health or events on the cows, for example. So we need to first access. Once we are able to access, we bring all the data to a central location, as I mentioned before, and then we decode the data, meaning that uh, we are able to read basically the data and make it available in a computer format rather than a, a human format. And then after that, we need a process to clean the data because you probably are familiar with the fact that a lot of the data that comes from these systems uh, would have repeated data would have uh, a lot of noise or invalid data. And if we put all that and we just throw to the tool that we are trying to produce for decision making, we may uh, have a lot of errors and the system would actually not work. So this process also takes quite some time and we need to be uh, also systematic in a way that we can clean and the cleaning should be constantly as the data are arriving. And then it comes this homogenization of the data that basically is, regardless of what the software has collected the data, at the end, we should have a very clean database for each one of the different streams of data we are looking like. For example, feed, regardless if it comes from TMR Tracker or Feed Supervisor or FeedWatch, at the end, we will have just the data we need for the analysis later on. And then another very challenging part on this process is the integration of the data. So we need to be able to actually find the ID. If this data of feed is at the pen level, we know normally it's not at the cow level, we need to be able to 
connect this data of feed at the pen level with the data of the milking, every single milking at the cow level. And that imposes obviously additional challenges that we are uh, dealing and working at the moment. Just wanted to give you uh, a brief, a brief uh, overview of what, what it takes in order to make this process to work. So once we have the data, uh, we go to that uh, objective that we call specifically the dairy brain part of the dairy brain project in which we are developing tools to make better decisions. And we classify these tools in three main uh, areas, descriptive, predictive, or prescript prescriptive tools. The descriptive ones are this, the ones that we are all use that we just uh, look at the data. It's, it's a visualization basically of the data like a dashboard. That's very important, but it's not doing a lot of analysis with the data. It's just displaying the data. In the predictive uh, level, we are projecting. We are simulating what's going to happen in the future based on the past, basically. And probably the most advanced tools would be these pre predictive ones that actually uh, will propose optimal management actions to the farmer. Whether the farmer does follow these recommendations or not is a different level, and that also should be used into producing these tools. But these prescriptive tools, like for example, using machine learning or optimization, can uh, set up potential actions based on the decision making of the tool. So here are some tools we are uh, planning to actually deliver uh, within a year or so. But we are working, many of these tools already are in different levels of work and they just need to be connected with the actual data on the, on the agricultural data hub. But I just wanna give you a brief overview what to expect on this first set of tools, for example, from the dairy brain. And again, they are classified, as I mentioned before, on the descriptive tools that normally are operational or short term. Then the predictive that normally will go to the tactical midterm decision making. And the prescriptive, the ones that will suggest the actions are more in the long term strategic decision support tools. And you can see here examples that uh, some of them have been developed already, but they need data to work uh, more efficiently. If we go to the top group here of the operational short-term descriptive tools, we have as example, a simple daily feed efficiency. Like for example, calculate milk over feed, but every single time for every single pen, and even though that mathematically, it's simple, or from the algorithm standpoint of view, it's very simple. It does require integrated data feeding to the tool every single time. Like for example, data from the milking parlor, DHI, or feed and feed monitoring for sure, right? And what would be the benefit of that that can provide early warnings if the feed efficiency is changing or there is some disruption at some point, right? So it is a very, very important tool and, and, and probably many of you uh, farmers are, are doing this and you can do this manually. The challenge here is to make it this efficiently every single time for every, every single pen and for the whole farm and be able to have it at the fingertips, right? Every single time I wanna see it, I have that number available. I don't need to recalculate every single time, right? So we, have, we go now, just as an example, in the midterm, these tactical predictive tools, like for example, we can use machine learning. So the algorithms would be more advanced to select traits uh, to either reduce, uh, to predict the clinical mastitis event, uh, whether it is in the long term or whether it is a few days before a potential clinical mastitis case would occur based on historical data and previous events on the animal. And then again, we will need to integrate data from management and genetics, for example, 
And uh, the, the big benefit is that we will have less disease, healthier cows, and obviously this has an impact on, on welfare and impact on the profitability of the farm for sure. And let me give you also uh, finally uh, a tool more in the long-term strategic, uh, uh, what we call prescriptive tools. Like for example, we have developed this and this has been published and, and we are looking forward to implement actually on, on a farm once we get all the data available. Like for example, improving the nutritional accuracy on a farm continuously. And in order to do so, so we have, uh, we need, uh, certain level of, of uh, optimization, like a nonlinear programming and a clustering algorithm that will put together um, cows that are more alike in the requirements of nutrients together in groups and allows us also to recalculate or switch a little bit the diets in order to provide more uh, closer to the requirement diets. So if we put all the data from management, the feed monitoring, DHI, and parlor data, we can do this very efficiently. And actually, we have demonstrated on that uh, paper I was mentioning uh, that we can more accurately feed every single cow and the whole herd. And that obviously has implications on feed efficiency, reduced cost of feed, and higher profitability, and also better standing on the uh, uh, environment because less nutrients will be wasted out of uh, the cows. And with that, I would like to transition, start transitioning to the next uh, uh, part of Liliana. But before we go to that, we want to do a very uh, quick poll question uh, in what type of tool you are uh, more interested in. If you don't mind uh, answering this very quickly on your uh, systems, that would be uh, very nice to have that information and get uh, a little of participation of the group. You can see there in the answers, uh, A, B, and C follow the, the previous slide, short term, mid term, or long term, or D, other. Thank you, Victor. Um... While we're working to answer that question, if you do have any questions um, for Victor right now, you can feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, otherwise, you can, as you think of them, put them in there. And when we get towards the end of the program, we, we will answer those questions. Um, as these questions, uh, you're continuing to finish answering the questions. I am going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Liliana Falul is an animal scientist currently working as a research associate at the laboratory of Dr. Victor Cabrera in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences uh, at the UW-Madison as part of the Dairy Brain Project team. Dr. Liliana completed her PhD at the University Lavelle in Quebec, Canada. There she recognized the potential use of data science techniques to help identify problems and offer solutions in the animal science field. Learning and exploring these applied techniques, particularly in dairy farms, became her true passion. At the Dairy Brain Project, Dr. Liliana is integrating different data streams generated on and off the farm. These integrated data are prioritized and analyzed using different machine learning techniques with the objective of developing management decision tools. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Liliana. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for all the ones that are joining us online today. Um, so as Victor mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more the specific part about the extension program of the Dairy Brain, which we call uh, the Data Money Program. Uh, next. So this is you already saw this slide. So these are kind of the four objective of the of the dairy brain project, which the four objective or the kind of the last one is the extension program. Um, that it's going to be kind of designing and executing all the part of the data integration and data usage um, on farms. Next. 
So the idea behind the data money program is that um, give to the farmers and like to all the benefits about using data, using data integration and how we can also kind of use like appropriate use of decision support tools and doing all of these between the different extension agents, the advisors, the farmers themselves, obviously, and if they are involved also kind of nutritionists or other different industries, they are also welcome. Um, the idea of the data money is like to do type of webinars like this one um, or in person whenever it's possible again, do some workshops and also do all the part of demonstration and facilitation about data usage uh, on farm. Next, please. So there are kind of different steps. So we normally start with a daily brain meeting, which is something as we were doing today. Um, and then we start meeting more kind of personalized with, with, with the farm team. So normally at the first meeting, we kind of introduce ourselves. So the daily brain team or the data money team and the team from the farm. And we set some goals according to the preference of the farm. The part, the part that is really, really interesting about this data money project is that it's really based on the different interests and the different needs of each of the farm. So it's highly personalized uh, project. Um, the second farm, um, with the second meeting with the farm, it will be kind of to decide which are the priorities. And the third and ongoing meetings will be just uh, a lot of feedback between the farmer and the data money um, people or team, um, doing some revisions of what the farmer wants, what, it's, what are we doing, what are we working? And this is always kind of a continuous process based on what are the priorities of the farm. Next. So we hosted our first dairy brain meeting back in February, 2020. That sounds like a long time ago. Uh, that was uh, before the um, COVID stopped. So we, we were kind of, we were glad to do that one in person. Um, and we did a very similar presentation um, that we are kind of doing today. Next. So as I mentioned before, the first meeting of the data money program is just to get to know the farm, um, to get to know the team. Uh, we have kind of a registration form. Um, so we kind of know a little bit more what's going on in the farm. Um, this is kind of the basic information of the farm. So what's the name of the farm? What's the name of the farmer? Where is located and all that stuff. Um, next. So the next part is also kind of uh, of the first meeting is we just kind of know the, with the farmer with with part of her his or her team at the farm want to work at. So it's kind of which are kind of the members. Uh, we kind of plan the next meetings um, according to the availability of the farmer, um, and we do like an integrated or just a data usage assessment. And if they integrate data and if they are using their data just to know a little bit more, um, where is the point uh, to start next? Um, so yeah, so in this data, in the integrated data use assessment or the data usage assessment, we start with what is the data available at the farm, if they are using or doing some type of integration, um, and if, if they are doing, even if they are using so, and how they are doing that. So next. So there is a form, exactly. So where we do kind of this um, inventory of the data that is available at the farm. So that's kind of an example about of what is available, what software is it, if it's used frequently, uh, what is the frequency, um, and normally what they do. Next. So then we kind of go a little bit uh, more in detail. So if there are decisions made using integrated data or not, if there is a need from the farmer to do some data integration um, and what potentially decisions could be made with the usage um, of data integrated or the different data sources at the farm in general. Next. 
So basically, like in, during the first meeting of the data money, it's kind of doing the data use usage assessment um, and knowing a little bit more what's the current status um, of the usage of the data usage at the farm. Next. So the idea also of the of this first meeting is just to do um, to set the goal and kind of prioritize the goals that we're going to work during the next year normally um, and what are going to be the benefits. This kind of prioritization and the goals can also be changed according uh, that we are working on and if something came out we can also just kind of rearrange stuff and focus in different um, tools that we can work also. Next. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the goals of the years. We kind of have like a format when we just everything we write it down so we don't lose track about what we talk during the meetings. Uh, next. So we were talking about like what are the kinds of data? So it will depends on the farm again, but you're gonna have normally you have milk production, feed, management, health. If you want to talk, if you want to integrate also financial data, that's completely valid. So at the end is any data related data. Uh, that is available at the farms or the farm is willing maybe to start collecting. Next. And what kind of goals? So we talk about performance, it could be production, it could be management, it could be decision making, again, financial, anything that it's related to the dairy farm. And again, it's kind of what the farmer wants to prioritize, peri that's so difficult word, prioritize in the farm. Next. So um, how much time does this require? Um, this is pretty flexible uh, program. It's a self-directed process. The farm decide how often to meet according uh, to its availability. Normally we met every other month or monthly. Um, normally there are short meetings around one hour or less. Um, and the idea of this meeting is just to get feedback of the different developments of the different tools um, and just keep moving on um, and with the short update and short feedbacks and just to make sure that everything is according to the expectations of the farmer and then everything is kind of running, running correctly. Next. So at the end, the idea is that um, the farmer is going to have a, personal, a personalized tool according to its goals. Um, that hopefully it's going to help with the decision making progress at the farm. And at the end, this is going to give like the added value to the data that it's normally available at the farm. Next. So, yeah, again, so just like a brief um, summary about what I talked. So how does it work? So meetings are normally held online. We normally met once per month with the farm team, so the farmer, nutritionist, consultant, um, the extension agent is normally also in the meetings and the dairy brain team. And based on the interest of the farm, um, we normally have an agenda um, before the meeting and we discuss the progress feedback uh, with the farmer and the team and the dairy brain team and the extension agent. Next. Okay, and with that, um, we want to ask you about uh, what do you think is the more attractive thing of the data money program? Um, so you have A, B, C, D, E options um, about it is free, it could provide better insights with the data already available, could allow to fuse data of different systems at the farm, team brainstorming on improving data management and decision making, or all of the above. And I Thank think you. with that, yeah. Dr. Liliana. Um, and if at any time, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, Lisa also put the link in there. Um, if you're interested in possibly enrolling in the data money program, there is a link to sign up or visit the website for more information as well. And so as um, everyone is answering the poll question, I would like to take this time to introduce our next speaker today, uh, Mr. Daniel Diedrich, Farms near Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
there, which I think is pretty cool, his farm is the closest grade A dairy plant to uh, dairy to Lambeau Field. And they milk about 540 cows in a state-of-the-art facility. Dan prides himself on adopting new technology and relishes trying to do things differently. The young stock are partially custom raised and partially raised on a 500 acre intensive management grazing farm. And the mixed herd of cows went robotic in 2011 and are milked in with eight D Laval robots. He is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Madison. And there he learned how powerful partnerships with the university and extension can be a valuable um, and the value of access using programs through extension or the university. So with that, if everyone is finished answering the poll questions, I will turn it over to Dan. All right, well, thank you for, uh, I guess, listening to me today and uh, taking this opportunity to walk through uh, my dairy and how we've utilized the data money program to try and make some better decisions and have things make a little more sense. So I guess a little bit about my dairy first before uh, we get into the um, nuts and bolts really of what we've been doing so you can kind of understand the angle from which we uh, came through. So as stated, my, my dairy is 540 uh, adult cows and then the accompanying young stock, which is partially on the dairy and uh, partially not. But we've been milking with robots now since 2011. So uh, we're in our 11th year this year already. So we've been longtime users of it. And one of the things we learned very early on was that we collect far more data than we can really make sense of and utilize. And so I was excited when we went to the data money meeting that was held uh, near Green Bay here um, and first heard about kind of the data money program and what it, it might be able to offer. I said, well, this could be an opportunity for our dairy to try and make better sense out of all the information that we're collecting. Uh, we have a mixed herd, which is about a third Holstein, a third Jersey, and a third crossbred. So it creates some unique data challenges for us that maybe a pure uh, one breed or another might not necessarily see, which I think provides a good test case for um, the data and a good opportunity for the data money people to really show their, their uh, metal, if you will. And I can say that I think it's done a lot of good for us. Um, so with our, our mixed herd and our robots, we had a, a lot of information, as I said, and I was doing a lot of things manually, unfortunately, which I was, uh, I guess, not too happy about. I'm kind of a, a data nut, if you will. So I collect a lot of information, but I didn't necessarily have a good way to control it. And so I was running a lot of spreadsheets that was involving a lot of manual entering. And I had built some formulations and things in there, but it wasn't necessarily all the things I wanted it to be. Um, so that's kind of where we started and, and how we got involved in the program. And so I guess now we'll walk through a little bit of, I guess, the case study of what's been happening on our dairy now for, I think, the last two years, if I'm right, almost, we're coming up on uh, that we've been involved in the project. Um, I still have the poll results up here, so I'm going to hit close on that so I can see what's happening. Um, so I had had a budget projection or a budget tool that I had created on my uh, computer in, in a spreadsheet that was partially dynamic and allowed me to change certain parameters in it in a more simple manner and fill out my budget for the year uh, for both lending purposes uh, with my banker and then for personal use in terms of just trying to uh, benchmark how I was planning to run my business for the year. And uh, it had been far more dynamic in the feed production side than in the milk production and feed usage side. So I had good ways to massage around how, how many acres I had and kind of how I was bringing feed onto the dairy, but not really a good way of figuring out how much feed I was going to use and project that out for the year. We purchased the majority of our feed from neighboring farms. So being able to plan with them how many ton of corn silage I need, for instance, is pretty important. And I don't necessarily want to lock up more acres than I need. So 
then sorry yes. to interrupt you. Just let me know whenever you want me to pass the slides. Yep, will do. Great, thanks. Sorry. So, so we had this budget projection thing, and, and one of the things I wanted very badly was to be able to get better usage information in terms of my feed and better production estimations in terms of what my herd was going to do. As I shift up and down with my dairy numbers of Holsteins or jerseys or crossbreds, as you can imagine, that would totally change how things look in my herd from a feed usage standpoint and a solids production and economics view. So we really wanted to try and improve that budget projection um, portion of it. It was really good at a kind of a snapshot the way I had it, but it didn't really do a great job of projecting out some of those variables that affect a, a farm very dearly. And then also I wanted to do, um, I get a better handle on income over feed costs and feed efficiencies per breed. I had that information or I already have that information from a whole farm basis and a um, split of the farm. So I have a Jersey barn and a Holstein barn and my crossbreds are just kind of shoved in wherever they fit, wherever there's openings, they kind of float back and forth. So it made it difficult for me to estimate accurately how my income over feed costs for my various breeds was doing. So when I want to do another expansion or change something, I can make a wiser decision regarding that. Um, so that was one of the things I wanted a better handle on as well. And then as we were working through this, um, a better selection process for me in terms of how I'm deciding who to call and who to keep on the dairy. It's a simple, it's a simple decision but there's a lot of information that can give me a better answer to that decision. So if we move to the next slide, we can kind of get a little picture of kind of how we first worked in the, um, in the process. So I already have my monthly data all the time of cows and milk production. It was there, it was easy. What I wanted to get was projecting out the number of cows I was gonna have in each of my different breed categories their milk production in each of those breed categories. So it could be utilized into a budget projection. Um, comparing or adding into that, obviously the herd economics um, and things like that, that I had already had pretty good or pretty well done inside my budget. So when we can combine that in together with the number of cows and you have a lot of items on a dairy that are on a per unit basis, uh, the number of cows for different breeds can really matter. So. That was kind of the goal was to create that beige area and really flesh out my budget projection. So next slide. So here's my uh, office. It doesn't usually look that clean, I'll be honest, but uh, you can see my three screens that I operate there and I've got some spreadsheets on it and you can kind of see what I'm working with on a daily basis. And on the right here is the result of some of the data money program. So this is a portion of my uh, spreadsheet that I had had. Uh, I had gave access to uh, Victor and Liliana and they did their magic, which um, I won't talk about obviously because I don't know what they, I mean, I understand what they did, but um, it was far easier on my end than it was on their end. I just said, here it is and they did it. But um, you can see it. it I see it's kind of small if you're looking on a phone for sure, but um, what we have there is all my different breeds, three different breed categories, Holstein, Jersey, and Crossbred, broken down by month in terms of what the projected number of them is, the projected milk production of each of them is, and then that yields to pounds of solids, and then that ends up as total solids, right, for the dairy, which is how I get paid. So it works its way right through, and then the same projected numbers of cows for each different breed category also works through on the feed side. And this is like the whole top third of my uh, spreadsheet right now that was just added on top of what I had already had. So that way these numbers are all added up each month. And so I have breeding costs per month that are projected out and it's pretty consistent. I can tell you how many dollars I'm gonna spend per cow, but now I have a better projection in terms of how many cows I'm going to have each month um, going out. Now. I'm sure a lot of you are saying to yourselves, well, I already have that information in my herd uh, software, which I do as well. I mean, I have projections in terms of what my projected milking numbers were gonna be um, in that, but is that in my financial software? No, so now it is. That's kind of what this whole process 
has done is it's brought together these different parts from my Dale of software that I have on Dairy into my financial planning uh, spreadsheets that we'd created on the farm. And I guess I should have mentioned who my team was uh, that we have besides the data money team um, and the folks from Extension. I had my nutritionist involved. My dad was involved as well. And we had someone from Dale Laval involved to help us um, kind of parse through getting the data and what data was or was not available. Uh, we had some historical issues we needed to work through in terms of um, what data was there from the past and wasn't there and how far back we could stretch for data in order to have better forward-looking projections. So that was kind of the team we worked with for the most part through this uh, process. My veterinarian was not involved. Uh, I'm married to her. For those of you that, that know me, you already know that, but uh, my veterinarian was not involved. She just kind of said, well, you do you, Dan, and uh, anything you have, you can just talk to me about separately. So um, she didn't get involved in the process, but that would be somebody that you might want to involve as well. So if we move on uh, to the next slide. Um, with that budget projection then, we add in all these information pieces, uh, our DHI information, um, which I copy and paste essentially. I export it into a Word document and I just highlight the whole thing and export it in. So it's really easy um, to do. Uh, Liliana made that uh, very simple. And our cows in our pen, our lactation information, milk production information, milk composition information from the plant, uh, the diet, what the feed costs are that we do. Then we wanted to run all of this information through uh, comparisons with NRCS and um, the CNCPS, um, or the NRC, not NRCS, <laughs> um, and try and take that information and do dry matter intake calculations for the different breeds. Um, and then we worked with some, my nutritionist to kind of model those numbers back and forth and massage them until we came up with numbers that really made sense for our modeling for inside my financial software. So this was all information that really was not involved with my robots at all. This was just me wanting to know what are my dry matter intakes for my different breeds. I already had in information on what my Holstein side of the barn was and my Jersey side of the barn, but not what each breed might be because of the crossbreds in there. So with this information, the goal was to try and um, figure out what that actually looks like. So if we go to the next slide, I think we work into that a little bit better. Um, yeah, so we've got my feed rations here that I manually input. Um, they're, they're simple. There's not a lot of different ingredients in them. Um, so I manually input my prices that I'm paying for things. And this is kind of stuff I was doing before, but we replicated it on a monthly basis to better tie into the rest of what the uh, projections were doing. Um, so we have the ration cost, the, the feed prices that I'm paying for different things, and the amounts I'm feeding to each of the different rations. And then it works its way across to get us the usage information for each of those different ingredients. And then we can do the um, dry matter intake and then eventually income over feed cost calculations with that information that we have. So the yellow things is all that I'm entering. Everything else is information that's calculated out. Some of it I want to see um, from just an analysis point of view, I like to look at it. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so we take the dry matter estimations then, we've got our milk production information, and then we can get our feed efficiency for the breeds. Uh, so you can see I got some pictures of some cows here. Uh, we kind of milk anything with four legs and uh, can pay its way. I don't really care what it is. Um, so uh, we've got some ugly cows, some pretty cows, some jerseys, some Holsteins, and, and everything in between that you can imagine. And so we wanted to really kind of work through what this actually looked like for us. Um, so we can take our uh, feed efficiencies then and that information, take our uh, milk revenue and our feed costs, which are also in that, right? Because it was my financial projections stuff and then get our income over feed costs uh, by cow and breed. So 
I have a lot of data coming in from a lot of different sources, but all of these things are really, to me, something anyone can do and, and utilize. Obviously, I have a, uh, a robot system that collects all kinds of extra data, but it's when we were in a milking parlor, we did a lot of the same data collection, um, some of it manually, some of it not. And so it, it's kind of a continuation of that. The problem for us was as time went by, we added more and more data and had less and less results of it. Um, so really the first two parts of our project had nothing really to do with us having robots per se. It was just managing the dairy and, and doing budgeting and uh, feed efficiency and income over feed cost calculations for the dairy. Um, the next part, our um, culling decisions and our index tool that was created is a little more robot specific. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I think we start to get into that. No, we got more of this, I forget, yeah. Um, so feed efficiency and income over feed. You can see kind of how we worked through this. I have my pen. Um, we've got the number of animals in there, average lactation, milk, fat, uh, which gives fat percent, which gives you the fat pound, fat or protein, same thing, you get the kilogram, um, work your way through all the different maps, compare everything back through with the uh, NRC and CNCPS calculations. And you can see how they're not the same, right? They don't agree on what a model cow should look like. And that was always one of the issues I ran into is when trying to do these estimations is that my herd isn't standard, right? No one's it everyone's herd is their own from their breeding decisions they have made throughout time and how they've fed and, and grown their animals. So we needed to find a way to kind of adjust those informations to come to the, the best case, best use case scenario for us to, to come with the right income over feed costs um, results in the end. Next slide. So um, here you've got my whole scene. Um, crossbreeds and jerseys. You can see the number I had on that particular day of each of them. So about even for the whole scenes and crossbreeds, less jerseys, uh, those numbers, as I said, fluctuate up and down. But you can see my average dry matter intake in pounds on those. Um, and the feed efficiency conversion there and how they're different between CNCPS and NRC, we had to decide kind of which ones made the most sense for the different groups um, so we could do this. So we could end up with income over feed cost per cow per day, um, and then do it on a breed basis as well. So you can kind of see where they really uh, break out. So on my herd, it showed that my crossbreeds and jerseys, while they don't milk very good, right? Um, they don't eat much either. So they don't, they, they actually shown, it actually shows how good they did. My income over feed cost is better on my, uh, jerseys and crossbreeds than it is my whole scene. So this helped solidify what I thought I already knew and, and felt like I already knew, but it showed me even more that on my dairy with my management and how we do things, that was the case. Um, and mostly it's just because I think because they eat a lot less, <laughs> um, but I wasn't sure of this. And so now I have a little bit better data proof, proof of concept here um, as we work through all this information to kind of see what really is the case and not be just guessing about things. And I can make statements now, I can tell you that this is the case instead of saying, well, I think. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so then we worked on something that became a lot of fun and it was really interesting um, is when I made calling decisions in the past, it was just straight up, um, is she paying her way or not in terms of just brute force guessing, right? So you take how many pounds of milk is this cow doing? What's her fat and protein? Maybe you take that into account a little bit um, and you just say yes or no, right? It wasn't a very good way to go about selecting a cow as being worthwhile to bring back or, um, or continue to keep. So when I was looking at my herd, one of the things that always bothered me is I have cows that milk in four minutes and I have cows that take 12 minutes. And I can milk three, four minute cows in the time I milk that one 12 minute cow. So is that 12 minute cow really paying her way? Um, the robots are expensive. 
Uh, they are my labor and my milking parlor rolled into one. So I have a lot of dollars tied up per minute of operating there. So it's kind of like on a rotary for those people that might be running those. You know, you're limited by what the slowest cow on that rotary is doing in terms of how many cows you can milk per hour, um, how fast you can turn that. It's the same with a robot, except it's just one cow. It's not a whole gang of them going around in a circle. It's just one cow. So how long is that cow tying up my milking system? So I always felt like those cows that took a long time were probably costing me more money than they were worth. But um, what I needed to do was kind of create a more robust way of going through my cows and, and making wiser decisions as to whether or not that cow should continue to stay. So Liliana uh, dreamt up this cow selection index. And if we go to the next slide, you can see we started with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, we took all this data and then she ran it through a principal component analysis, which looked at how it correlated to itself or to the other data points. So we could decide were all of these pieces of information necessary, um, whether it's a positive correlation or a negative correlation you can make. If it's a perfect negative correlation, you can make a very wise comment about that data uh, with that information. So she ran these all through and you can see there's a lot of different pieces of information here from harvesting flow to lactation status and number, uh, how much they're being milked, all this stuff you would get about a cow in a milking system. So if we go to the next slide. She ran it all through and essentially what we found out is we really only needed four variables. So uh, as I said before, we, we get all this data, but is it all useful? And through her analysis, she found, well, really we didn't need to use all of that to make decisions because so much of it was so heavily correlated with other data points. We could just use any one of those data points that was heavily correlated. So she made an initial score. And as we were looking at it uh, on the dairy, the thought came in that, well, realistically, a cow that's 190 days pregnant, I am not going to treat the same in my culling decisions as a cow that's 30 days pregnant or open. So we decided on 110 days as a cutoff. Um, why 110? Because we have to pick a, a day, right? There has to be a cutoff. But we added an adjustment to those cows that were pregnant, where I said, those cows that are pregnant and they're um, farther along, we're going to keep more than likely. So they get an added score bonus. Um, given to them, kind of like a, a gold star on their card uh, that says, hey, you did good, you got pregnant at least. So that way, they're less likely to hit the bottom levels because what initially happened is we saw a lot of cows that were about to dry off were hitting the selection cool tool for culling. Well, I'm not, I don't want to cull a cow that's uh, 200 days pregnant and about to go dry. I want to dry her off. Um, but if I have a cow that's hitting the, the culling uh, index and is um, 30 days pregnant, well, <laughs> I might wanna move her out because the likelihood I wanna keep her for another 240 days is pretty slim if she's already not pulling her weight. Um, so I think we can actually hit that link, um, right, Victor? And we can pull up the tool, maybe not. If we can, it's going to be awesome, and you can yes, see it. Yes, 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 we can, and and uh, we should do it. I think that's a great thing. But I will need to stop sharing and share the other screen for just a second. Okay. Um, so while Victor is doing that, um, you'll be able to see kind of the tool and just what it looks like that she made, and it it really is amazing for me. And we use it, and it's it's pointed out some cows to me that were, you know. 100 days pregnant and they were taking longer to milk than they should and they weren't milking as much you know they're slightly below average cow milking pregnant first service kind of the cow that never hits the radar screen for any reason and you find out well they were below average on everything right consistently below average in uh turns and milking time and so they were just 
not getting hit on the culling list, but really they're not a cow you want to keep. And actually they're more detrimental than probably that do not breed cow that is milking really fast that you're not going to end up getting pregnant because she's already 300 days in milk, but she's still milking 85 pounds. Can you see well, I call that cow yet when I have another cow that's milking 30%. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got it up. So uh, which one are you on right now? I can't even. It's so small for me. You're on just the regular index, not the flag cows. Go to the flag cows one. Let me let me try to increase the Actually, size a little bit so everybody can see well. Yeah. So actually, maybe Liliana should talk a little bit about the index. Um, that, that looks a lot better. Um, maybe Liliana should talk a little bit about the index and she created it and it was her child. But I just kind of use it. Um, well, I guess the basic idea as you describe it, it was Liliana? just kind of to mute it. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Can, uh, okay. can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Liliana. Um, yeah, so the idea behind the, behind the index was kind of a ranking of cows. So you have normally in your herd, you have your top cows and your low cows. Um, and here, like with that, like Dan was explaining, like in the in a robot system, it's kind of critical because of the time and the occupancy of the robot. So we really wanted to have like a some tool that you can just rank them and know if they, if you have a cow that is low today, if she's gonna be low the rest of the lactation or if it's just gonna fluctuate according to the time. And what we find with the index that we developed um, with Dan and, and his team, it was that there are like some kind of fluctuations, but if a cow is gonna be low, she's gonna be low the whole lactation. At least something happened to her and we can see that if when you that's why we did like some flat cows so those are the cows Victor if you can go there um and just for example I don't know just select um the if you go back then you just take the number so 36 78 and if you go to the index back and just right there Yeah, so here we just have like the, we have two index. So we have the index, which is kind of the plain one that is not adjusted according to the days in pregnancy. And we have the adjusted index that is kind of um, adjustment when the cow got pregnant. Um, and then we have the herd index, the normal one and the herd, the herd index adjustment. So here, for example, you can see that this cow in the last extraction, she got flagged because something happened like, she when she was in 0 0.42, she was pretty high, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And then in this last extraction, she just dropped to 0 0.36. So something happened to her. So the idea of flagging those cows and having that ranking, it was like if she got, I don't know, mastitis or something is wrong with her, or if she's just low all the time and is not getting pregnant, well, just then can make a decision of what to do with that cow. So that was kind of the idea. Just yeah. to re-emphasize, re um, the index goes from, from zero to one, right? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 So the, yeah. The, the, the bigger, the better. The bigger, the better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you can see there kind of she's got it color coded. Um, red is bad, green is good. So the cows that are low on the index are uh, red. The cows that are high on the index end up being green. And um, so for those that are uh, color not impaired, it works well. And you can just kind of get a quick visualization of them or um, you can just sort it by who's low, go to the low cows or uh, yeah, low cows or top cows if you want to see who's just because you like to know who's doing great, you can do that. But uh, I'm typically looking at the bottom cows more. Um, and so I can pull up the cows and say, wow, this cow is on here low and she's always low. And she's been low. And guess what? She's 40 days pregnant. Why am I keeping this cow? She's the cow. I should have never got her bred in the first place. That's typically what I say to myself when I'm like, oh, this cow's pregnant. And then I say, why did I breed her? 
I should have looked down here first. If only I had this. Um, so that's the other thing. It, it, as it's done, is it's made me make better decisions about who I decide to um, even breed. Um, some cows I'm deciding to throw onto a do not breed earlier than I typically would have because I've looked down here and I said, well, shoot, this cow is uh, open and she's not that many days in milk actually, but why do I want to breed this cow? I might as well just milk her out for the lactation and get rid of her or even move her out now, depending on how low she really is. So I've been able to make a lot better. I feel like I'm making a lot better decisions anyway. Um, I guess the proof is in the financial results next year or the year after if I'm actually making better financial decisions, but it feels like I'm making better ones as I'm doing it, that's for sure. Uh, versus before where it was more just the, uh, the WAG, right? The wild ass guess as to whether or not it was a, uh, a good idea or not. You just, well, this cow's below a cutoff, so you move her out. Um, now I can kind of take into account a little more variables that are meaningful for my dairy. I understand for everyone, they might not necessarily be the same variables, but for those in a robotic situation like mine, these variables are. Uh, if I were in a parlor, I would have had different variables, obviously, or in a stanchion barn, but um, the same concept, I guess, is, is there for anyone's herd uh, if a tool like this is built. So thanks for uh, sharing that on there, Victor. We can go back to the slideshow, I guess. Sounds very good. Hopefully I'm not going over on time. I wasn't even paying attention to how long I've been talking. So I think you're, you're good. Okay. I can, I can get long winded. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So as I said, we had adjusted the score, um, for those cows that were pregnant and those cows that are farther along in their lactation. Um, because realistically I'm going to give a lot of cows opportunity if they're early in lactation as well. I mean, you're not going to call a cow that is low on the index score that's 30 days in milk or 20 days in milk um, unless she's really got a problem. Um, you probably will keep her and see if she at least is going up on to her peak. Some cows just uh, maybe she started with a retained placenta or something like that and you know she's going to turn around and be fine and she's just not quite there yet as well. So um, it, we take both of those things into account, pregnancy status and kind of those really early lactation cows are fit more favorable as well. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess this probably isn't my part, but um, I can say personally that all the uh, tools that the team uh, helped create with us um, have been very useful and uh, have been very easy for us to continue to do. So as I said, you know, the one tool just involved me exporting some stuff from my software um, and copying and pasting. I mean, the old uh, control C, control V, right? And, uh, and just put it in the other software, which couldn't be much easier. And then it, uh, all I have to do is press refresh on my browser and it takes care of the rest. And um, otherwise everything was kind of color coded. So that way, well, this is the box you enter data into and, and so you know, and it makes it really easy and I can just kind of look right across and see what I need to do. Uh, one of the things I do monthly, um, every test day I add my information in with copy paste. I do my ration information as well monthly and then the update on my cow numbers for the different breeds and what their actual milk production is right now since I have that information coming out of my milking system. And I can look at it and it shows up in the little red box that I haven't entered the data yet if it's uh, not there. So it makes it pretty easy for me to do um, as I'm doing it. So it, it, I know they did a lot of work behind the scenes and sometimes I'd be like, hey, can we get it to do this too? And then they probably rolled their eyes in the back of their head saying, well, sure, I guess we can do that. But uh, it certainly made it really easy for me in the end, which I appreciate as, uh, as the farmer using it because while I'm technologically advanced, I also have a lot of things to do, as I'm sure everyone here does. And so the faster I can do any of these things, the more likely it is to get done. So I want to say thanks as a as a, my last word on that. Sure. And, and, and we ahead. say thanks to you as well, uh, Dan. I think it, 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 it has been, it is a pleasure to, to work with you because uh, you go along and you provide good ideas and challenges and, and that's, uh, 
very, very fruitful for everyone, I believe. There is a question um, in the chat box. Well, there's some coming in and maybe this is a good time before we um, finalize and go into a few more um, questions here because we are, we are done with the presentation part of it today. Just have a couple more questions. But one of the questions is, why are you using the NRC FE, feed efficiency when the data can be calculated or when that data can be calculated? I don't know who wants to answer that. I, I think we, we uh... I think he's just asking how come you're using NRC, the NRC um, requirements along to, to calculate feed efficiency when there's maybe other ways to do that? Yeah. Um, so the reason we needed to do it is because I can't just take my pen feed efficiency and use that because I have multiple breeds in a pen. So the point was to use those numbers and compare them across versus the breed breakdown so we could actually figure out um, an adjustment factor on those information on that information to know what my different breeds were doing. Um, so it was because of the unique situation I have with the multiple breeds in a group and the challenges that creates from a data standpoint. I can't just calculate my feed efficiency for my breed because my breeds don't have their own pens. Thank you for that. Um, another question that came in, and this may be uh, for everyone or Dan, uh, again, when making the adjustment on pregnant cows, how are you determining what added value to give them? So I guess I can ask, I can answer that one. Um, so we just kind of broke the pregnancy kind of in like three sections. So we give like a uh, like 0 0.5 for early lactation, uh, 1.5, like mid, mid like uh, pregnancy, sorry, early, like lact early pregnancy, mid pregnancy, and like 2.5. Um, it was like pretty, just like, we don't like really did like an analysis. We just put like, uh, these, uh, these values and it seems to work. And the thing is like, we put these plus five, plus 1.5 and plus 2.5, but um, we didn't mention that, but all the values like for the different variables are like percentile ranks. So we give like the same weight to all the different variables that are calculated in the index and in the score. And that's why we have a score between zero and one. Thank you. Um at the moment, there are not any more questions popping up. So if you um, would like to, we can continue on to some poll questions. And if anyone that's on here does have um, some questions and you're not able to put in the chat box, you could you can feel free to unmute yourself as well and ask. And um, I would just like to thank um, all of our presenters today for the great information. Um, the evaluation questions are popping up. So if you can answer them, we would appreciate that. And um, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today for our Badger Dairy Insight series. Uh, the next one coming up is in two weeks. We are having them every other week and it will be on February 8th. And we are going to be talking about silage quality from pricing to feed behavior. Very good, thanks. Ashley, a, a favor, can you, I mean, probably you have registered the uh, attendees, can you, just forward an email with the link uh, if they are interested to uh, enroll in the data uh, money program beyond beyond the meeting. Yes, we should be able to send out. We do have it in the chat box, but um, I think we can add both of those links um, for the Google form as well as the Dairy Brain website when we. Um, stop the recording today and we get this all put together and transcribed, we will be sending the recording out to everyone that registered, um, even if you weren't able to be on the program today. And then they will have that information along with a recording of, of today's program. So we can definitely make sure we get that out. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
And if there are um, no further questions and you've answered the poll questions today, we appreciate you uh, all for joining us and look forward to seeing you again on February 8th for another episode of Badger Dairy Insights. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.